السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله Uh, yeah. So everything's working today with the mic. Alhamdulillah. I think to start they just really needed a reboot. You know, these computers, they act up. Is the video on? No, I don't see the video. I don't see the video. Wait, let me see if I can give you the access. Hey, you're the one that's going to have to think. Uh, you can start now. I think it should work now. Oh, sorry. You good? Uh, yeah. That view is okay? happen it says host has stopped your video Wait, so something on your end <laughs> um okay no no what happened i made you spotlight video uh, am i is this asking you to start the video now yep Okay. <clears throat> okay. So we can begin then, Shola. Let me know when you want to start, Shay. I just want to check one thing. start yes, three two one assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh brothers and sisters thank you for taking out the time on this sunday afternoon to be with us uh for this tafsir session 
Um, alhamdulillah, we are right now in the final stretch of Ramadan. Uh, we have now adapted considerably to these new ways. Uh, we have, alhamdulillah, heard, I'm sure, many lectures and given a lot of, we have been given a lot of guidance as to how we're supposed to cope and manage this particular situation. And today, inshallah, we're going to be looking at a story in Surah Al-Anbiya, which pretty much rounds everything up. We're going to see uh, in the life of one of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's beloved prophets and servants, uh, Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam, how he dealt with compound negative situations. Okay, we're not just dealing with one situation, we're dealing with something that was that came in succession in different phases, and every phase was worse than the previous one. So today, inshallah, we will be spending uh, quite a bit of time on analyzing the story of Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam, which is in Surah Al-Anbiya, and uh, then we'll mildly touch on the stories of other prophets alayhi salatu wasalam. So in the last lesson, we went over uh, the story of Dawood alayhi salatu wasalam and Suleiman alayhi salatu wasalam, and we spoke about the importance of consulting with each other, working with each other, making sure that we have a team environment at home when dealing with adversity. Because as we saw in the story of Suleiman alayhi salatu wasalam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can grant the proper comprehension and the solution to the issue or the matter that's at hand to one individual that may be subordinate to others inside that setting, but what they have right now is despite their position, they've got a solution that works. And that's what we saw in the story of Suleiman alayhi salatu wasalam. But when it comes to Dawood alayhi salatu wasalam, who's the father, he's the king, he's the prophet, he's got all the big uh, positions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to give Suleiman alayhi salatu wasalam an understanding that he did not extend to Dawood alayhi salatu wasalam at that time, which we see why it's so important for us to have an environment of what is called shura, consultation, talking to each other. Okay. So this is going to be a key component of getting through uh, the adversity that we are uh, facing at this moment in the name of COVID-19. You look at the subsequent verses and you're going to see uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enumerating the different bounties that he had bestowed upon the family of Dawood alayhi salatu wasalam. So we are not going to uh, look into that too much. I'm sure you can suffice with the translation on that. Um, but one of the things that you will find, not in the verses of Surah Al, um, what's it called, of Surah Al Anbiya, but you're going to find in other places. I'm sure it's going to be Surah Sad, where Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, when He's talking about similar things of the family of Dawood Alayhi Salatu Wasalam, He gives them one instruction, which I'm sure is definitely going to be relevant to all of us here. He says to them, after enumerating the many bounties He has bestowed upon them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is instructing the family, Dawood, the family of Dawood alayhi salatu wasalam, to be actively grateful. Okay, so i'malu shukra, if you remove the ala Dawood. So engage in acts of gratitude. So this is where you and I should also reflect during this time that as, as unideal of a life we are living right now, where there's reduced mobility, reduced activity, reduced interactions, it's not the ideal situation, but it's still far better than many different communities throughout the world. Okay, whatever it is that we are experiencing right now does not even come close when it comes to gauging and measuring the different levels of adversity. We're really still at the low end of the spectrum. Okay, we're still at, at the very low end. There are people that are basically losing everything, especially when it comes to living in war-torn countries where there's no sense of security, no sense of uh, hope and ambition. Prosperity is a thing that's simply a, a fairy tale. All of those things, you and I are not facing that. So we still have a lot to be grateful for and let me take it a step ahead. Even if we were in those situations where other people are 
basically deprived of everything, we still have a lot to be grateful for. The life that you and I have is something to be grateful for. Having our, our organs and our faculties to be functioning is something to be tremendously grateful for. And what is this, what is the real gratitude based on? We still have the opportunity to make huge gains in the hereafter, which is what we're all headed for and what we are working for in this world, despite having limited resources or limited comfort in this transitory world. Okay, so what I want to emphasize is don't let your shukr lack. Don't let your shukr be reduced. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has actively told or has told the family of Dawud to actively engage in gratitude, an instruction for them is, is an instruction for us. We still have so much around us that we should still be saying Alhamdulillah. It's actually, according to the hadith, Afdalu dua Alhamdulillah. Allahu Akbar. Afdalu dua Alhamdulillah. The, mo the most superior, okay, the, the superior prayer Typically, people translate it as supplication. I'm not so fond of that word. Uh, it's very outdated. But let's, let's translate it as prayer. The superior prayer, <coughs> according to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is Alhamdulillah. Okay, Alhamdulillah. That's a dua. So, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is basically alluding to this, that if we take out some time from our day, we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in prayer, in dua, extending these hands, and all we're saying is, Alhamdulillah, this dua is considered the most superior dua. Okay, and if it's superior, it's also going to have superior results. What is the superior result? لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ Allah will follow through with His promise of giving more. Right? That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's promise. So Allah says, اِعْمَلُوا آلَ دَاوُودَ شُكْرًا there's very there's a small number of my servants that are perpetually grateful. Shakur. This is Shakir. He said Shakur. Now what I want us to inshallah uh, become is that small group. That we are constantly, perpetually, all the time engaging in the gratitude of Allah. Every single moment we're saying, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Okay, if we do that, then we will qualify to be amongst this group, the small group, which is perpetually grateful, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will follow through with whatever He has promised us as a result of this. Okay, so that's the thing that we needed to really emphasize today. Going forward, uh, I want to jump the verses. We're not going to go into, like I said, all the details of what Allah bestowed upon Dawud Ali Salatu's family. So we're going to jump to verse number 51. If you do have your Qur'ans in front of you, your translations in front of you, go to verse number 51. That's where we're going to conduct today's lesson from. So in this uh, part, uh, uh, sorry, I have actually misnumbered that. I was looking at the wrong page. Go to verse number 83, not 51. We've already covered 51. So go to verse number 83. That's where we're going to, inshallah, uh, conduct today's session from. And in this, what you're seeing is the Prophet Ayyub being spoken about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَيُّوبَ إِذْ نَادَى رَبَّهُ أَنِّي مَسَّنِيَ الضُّرُ وَأَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ وَأَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to the Prophet, uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, mention Ayyub. Okay, make mention of Ayyub. So, alayhi salatu sallam. So this is a Prophet that you are going to speak about and talk about in your community. And what what part of his life do you actually want to highlight? Well, this is the part. إِذْ نَادَى رَبَّهُ You want to highlight the part when he called upon his Lord. إِذْ نَادَى رَبَّهُ He called upon his Lord. And what was the call? What was the dua? Anni masani al-dur wa anta arhamu rahimin Anni masani al-dur wa anta arhamu rahimin I have been touched by adversity and you are the most merciful of merciful beings. Uh, Subhanallah. So, there's a lot to unpack here. 
um, we highlighted the different methodologies of accessing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy in previous lessons. We spoke about the Abrahamic methodology, the methodology of Lut alayhi salatu islam, the methodology of Nuh alayhi salatu islam, and the conduct of, Ayu, uh, of Dawood and Suleiman alayhi salatu islam. So, um, Ibra just as a recap, Ibrahim alayhi salatu islam's methodology was what? It was to make a verbal declaration of his trust in Allah. Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Lut alayhi salatu islam's methodology was persistence in the, uh, in the lifestyle of piety. That was his way of accessing Allah's mercy. Okay, being persistent in being pious. Nu alayhi salatu islam's methodology was to basically display all of his emotions and his feelings to Allah and then ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do away with these people that he was sent to and who were not really responding. Okay, so that was Nu alayhi salatu islam's methodology of dua. Now dua, obviously this is the foremost way of accessing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, but then there's going to be ways of making dua. So we spoke about how one of the ways of um, uh, doing dua is we're conversing with Allah. We're sharing our feelings with Allah. We're putting forth our sentiments in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so forth. We spoke about that elaborately. Here today we're going to uh, learn another way of speaking to Allah. So one way is being very explicit and open. Another is being subtle, but respectful. And that was the method that Ayyub Ali Salatu Wasallam had adopted. Okay. Look at the dua. It's not even a line. He said that I have been touched by adversity, and you are the most merciful among those who express mercy. It's an indirect dua. He is not making a, a very explicit and straightforward demand. Oh Allah, do this for me. He's not doing that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what he loves about this dua is number one, how subtle it is. And number two, how respectful and humble it is. Now, let's elaborate on the humble component. What you find in the tafsirs, what was the dur? What was the adversity that had touched Ayyub alayhi salatu islam? Let's, let's look at this, okay? According to the different um, narrations that you find recorded in the tafsirs, Ayyub alayhi salatu islam is a very prosperous individual. Okay? Ayyub alayhi salatu islam, prosperous individual, living a very uh, prosperous lifestyle. So that means ample access to cash, okay? ample resources, considerably uh, a big family. You have uh, 14... 14 children in total, seven sons and seven daughters, according to what the narration state. Which, and I said, I said the word considerably because this is such a relative number that in its uh, in its time would be somewhat of a, a medium size, close to a small size family, back in those days, based on those standards. Nowadays, that would be an ultra high, an ultra super big family, where our family sizes are reduced to just what. One or two children, normally at two we tap out. That's it. We can't have any more. Okay, and that's pretty much the way our mind has been conditioned in this industrialist uh, era. So what happens is, Ayub Ali Salatu Islam, he's got ample cash, big family that he can comfortably sustain, and at the same time, he's very well able and fit. Okay, so pretty much he's got everything going for him in life. He has a struggle-free life. That's where it comes down to, right? You have a struggle-free life. You have your cash. You have beautiful family. You have your health. What else do you want? Okay. What else do you want in life? So he's got what, what basically would render a person satisfied in this transitory life. But then, one by one, he is going to be tested. And Ayyub alayhi salatu islam, Keep this in mind. In the Quran, Ayyub Islam has been made the benchmark of patience. Ayyub Islam has been made the benchmark of patience. And that's why where you find his 
story being mentioned, you're going to see something Allah subhanahu wa says at the end of the story. Okay, he's going to talk about how his life is going to be. Um, basically, it says here. Uh, I want to move. Yeah, abidin. That his story is a reminder for those people who engage in worship. And in another place in Saad, you're going to see see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa dhikra li ulil albab. It's a reminder for those who have intellect. Okay. So Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam is going to be made a well, he is made a benchmark of patience in the Quran. And how so? So we're gonna talk about how he's made a benchmark and how his life is made into a lesson for those who come after him. The first thing that's gonna to happen to Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam is he's going to face a financial crisis. Very similar to what we're seeing right now. You know, you've got the snowball effect that we're seeing, okay? That one thing gets ruined and all of a sudden it's ruining other things in the chain and the situation is just getting worse. I mean, you just heard, right? Um, was it yesterday or the day before? The Air Canada is letting go, letting go of 20,000 more employees. I mean, they just let go of 15,000 uh, several weeks ago. Now another 20,000. Those are huge numbers, okay? And imagine the impact that this is now going to have on the entire industry. Do you think that the airline industry is going to be the same as it was before? I was just having this conversation just literally a couple of hours ago with one colleague. Uh, if this is to you know, be rolled out again, uh, which it will inshallah, do you think it's going to be as cheap as it used to be before, like for $500 or $200 or $300, I can go to this destination or whatnot? No, we know for a fact that the rates are going to be much more higher, which is now going to take away from our ability to fly as frequently as we used to. And at the same time, uh, one article just came out a couple of days back that how the expected wait times at airports is going to be increased to four hours. You should be four hours now at the thing at the airport and how there's going to be multiple stages of screening, uh, touchless types of technology, facial recognition, uh, and even inside the plane, you're only allowed to board after having your temperature checked, you have your PPEs, all there's going to be distancing and all that, like all that the luxury that we had is gone. Okay, so what you're seeing are similarities. Started from one thing, but then it had a snowball effect. It just kept on building and building and building. So our benchmark at this time is Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam. So Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam, he's going to first suffer a financial crisis. Now how so? There's no details really given on this. All we know is that the access and the resources that he had, they've been, they're gone now. He doesn't have them anymore. So now what's going to happen? It's going to get you anxious. You and I know the moment there's been reduced employment to a termination of employment. We are completely bewildered. Okay, we, we're not going to sleep properly. Okay, we lose our sleep. We lose our peace. We're wondering, how am I going to make ends meet? The first thing we're looking, okay, how much do I have in my savings? How long will I be able to manage? Okay, is it weeks? Is it months? How much? How long can I go? And the moment you're inching closer to the depletion of your sources, what's happening next? Now you're really losing sleep. You're losing hair. You're losing everything. Okay, so understand, um, when we are talking about other people suffering a financial loss, it doesn't hit home. Many times it doesn't hit home. It hits home when we also are in the position. And right now, you and I are somewhat, to some degree, are facing that position of reduced sources of income. Okay? And that in itself, it takes our comfort away. It now increases anxiety. It increases stress. Okay? And it could have a, a tremendous impact on our mental health. This is what Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam is going through. He's not going through reduced. He's going through a complete termination. It's gone. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing now. So if this is not bad enough, okay, and remember he's got a family to take care of. He's got his, he's got his family of 14 children. Okay, obviously he's going to have other expenses, but now that's gone. Now, the next thing that's going to be taken away is his family. 
according to certain reports. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only knows the accuracy of this, but they have been recorded and thus I share them with you. You're going to have one report suggesting that Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam's house collapsed. His house collapsed. And in that house was his family and there were no survivors. Okay, there were no survivors. Everyone, they basically lost their life when that house had collapsed. So what has resulted in? He's now lost his money. He's lost the thing that is the most dear to anyone, family, especially children. His wife, uh, whether he had multiple wives or had one wife, one wife for sure was with him. Okay, so she wasn't part of the calamity because she's now going to go forward and be an aid and assistance to him. But they're gone. Okay, the and it's easier said than done now. Keep this in mind. If we just lose one child of ours, we basically lose all of our peace. Okay, you've lost, in this case, let's say, a person has lost their job. They've been afflicted by COVID-19 or family member has been afflicted, especially a child, and that child has lost their life. Imagine what's going on in this person's mind. Okay, this is not going to be music to anyone's ears, especially for the person that's experiencing this. That's why look at this, this particular thing, uh, example. Okay, so they're gone, unfortunately. Okay, then afflicted with a disease. Let's put it like that. A source of inconvenience for the entire. He's going to release a foul odor, and you're going to have maggots that are coming out of the body. Uh, this is far worse than COVID 19. Okay. Yes, in COVID-19, a person is going to suffer for a small period of time. And a lot of people, alhamdulillah, are recovering. Some people may lose their lives. But relatively speaking, it's a shorter period of suffering. Let's put it like that. It's a shorter period of suffering. Ayyub is going to be with this condition for 18 years. One eight, not 18 months. Not 18 days, 18 years. Now imagine again, the psychological trauma you would be going through at that time. You can't even look at yourself in the mirror. You're not in a presentable manner at all. The moment we wake up, say for example, our face is all over the place, our hair is all over the place, our breath is not uh, smelling very pleasant. So what is the first thing that we do? We don't want to remain in this state. We will go, wash our face, brush our teeth, do our hair, and now, alhamdulillah, we look presentable. Okay, it makes us feel good, and it makes the people around us feel good. But, you wake up in the morning with this skin condition that is completely a blemish to your appearance. You have maggots that are coming out of your body, and you know, you're not in an ability to... You, I mean, Ayyub alayhi salatu became tremendously immobile as a result of this and his community according to certain reports picked him up and dumped him in the community dump yard in the community dump yard okay so remember they didn't have uh, the type of dump sites that we have right now which are vast and acres of land they would have a place that is designated as a dump place and Imagine that, your community dumping you there, telling you literally, let alone metaphorically, literally telling you you're a piece of trash. So how worse can it get now? How worse can it get? You started, look at the snowball effect. You started with money, that's gone. Your family is gone. Your health is gone. You've been abandoned by your own community. And remember, Ayyub alayhi salatu islam, was not an outsider to the community. He was a respectful individual, and this is what it's resulted in. Okay? And 
one thing, the reason I'm taking my time in explaining all of this is so that you can slowly digest this. I want you to try and put yourself in that situation and think, how would you re react? Okay, it's nice to sit down and listen to it as a story, but this is a true incident. It really happened and it can happen to any one of us. So I need all of us right now to put ourselves in the shoes of Ayub and ask ourselves, how on earth would I have coped? Okay, how on earth how would I have coped? Could I even cope? This is why the story of Ayub is so important. He demonstrated that yes, you can cope. He did it. Okay, and if he can do it, so can you and I. Because the Anbiya Islam are models for the rest of society, for the rest of humanity. They're models. What do you mean by model? They are someone that we can practically emulate. We can practically emulate if we choose to do so. Okay, we can, if we choose to do so. The same thing with our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I mean, this is one little um, tangent I'll go off on, but keep this in mind. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not just a, um, let's say this, uh, a figure that is, I mean, what's the word I'm looking for? It was just there on my lips. But anyways, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's not just a symbolic figure. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not just a figure that was brought to us for the sake of simply praising and revering. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was brought to us as a role model whose lifestyle we can all adopt if we choose to do so. And the reason I emphasize this is because you do have certain philosophies that circulate within our uh, community that no, the Prophet ﷺ, especially our beloved Prophet ﷺ, his life, it's too hard to emulate. It's it's not practical, okay? And it's not meant to be thing uh, emulated. All it is, it's just something that's going to be looked upon as symbolic. No, that, the Prophet ﷺ has been told us in the Qur'an as, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Within the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, there is an, an excellent example. So the prophets, whatever they have done, unless stated otherwise, unless stated otherwise, it is something that every human can practically do if they choose to do so. If they choose. Okay, keep this in mind. Yes, and the, I said stated otherwise because there would be certain practices that the Prophet wasallam would make very clear it's only for him and it's not for others to follow. For example, Somul Wisal continuous fasting okay where the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would start the fast on monday for example and do his iftar on thursday okay three days of consecutive fasts where there's no renewed suhoor or iftar so three days 72 hours of fasting rather than the 17 or 16 hours of fasting that we are doing and the prophet also made it very clear to other people that this is exclusive for him allah nourishes him Okay, in a way that is other people are not being nourished. So that's what we're talking about unless stated otherwise. So Ayyub alayhi salatu 18 years, he's now facing this, like the trauma, okay, the psychological, or the emotional impact that it's having. But then what happens? This is what I wanted to build up to. And this one sentence, it just blew me away, completely blew me away. Every time I read this, it doesn't fail to put me in awe. Okay, this one statement of Ayyub alayhi salatu salam, and I'm thinking, wow. Look at this statement. What happens is his wife, she comes to him, and she says, لو دعوت الله عز وجل. If only you could make dua to Allah, because this is a prophet. Ayyub alayhi salatu salam is one of the closest individuals, if not the closest individual on the planet at the time. Uh, and there's no contest in this. Right? The reason I say one, because there could be multiple prophets at a given time. So I'm not sure at his time if there are other prophets or not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Okay, so I'll just leave it at that. But we know that the rank of a prophet is second to none. 
Okay, so Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam has got that rank. Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam is so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the wife who is now serving him day in and day out with absolute loyalty. Obviously, you know, a time is going to come when she's going to also have some feelings to share. Okay, because this is not the ideal situation to be in. Okay. Uh, like this is the example of having one spouse that was completely fine and all of a sudden your spouse they suffer a car accident and that basically now paralyzes them now for the rest of your marital life you're going to have to serve this individual you're going to have to take him to the washroom you're going to have to bathe them you're going to have to feed them and so forth it's not an ideal situation it's a lot of work so she's putting in that work okay for a husband who's suffering this condition that has inconvenienced the community so much that they've dumped him in the community dump yard. Imagine that. So she says, Allah. If you were to only call upon Allah, look at this now. Okay. He says this. He asked her a question. And that question is that um how much how many years did we spend in prosperity? How many years did we spend in prosperity? So she said, around 80 years. So what does that mean? They're quite elderly at this time. This is a time when you really need support. Okay. So she said, 80 years. That's more than probably a lot of us that are uh, listening and tuning in right now. We're not 80 years of age. So Ayyub alayhi salatu islam, what is he asking? How many years of prosperity did we live? The answer is 80. 80 years. Then he says, Inni astahi min Allah an adu'uahu wa ma makaftu fi bala'il muddatan lati makaftuha fi rikha'i. Allahu Akbar. It's like this is such a knockout statement. He says, I I am shy to go in front of Allah and ask him, Wamamakathtu, when I have not even remained in this adversity of mine for the duration that I have remained in the state of prosperity. Allahu Akbar. Eighty years I spent in prosperity, and it's only been eighteen years now. Or so we don't know exactly at what time he's making this statement, but it's going to be within that that period, right? A decade and a half. So it's only been around a decade and a half in what's it called it um, in adversity. Like, why am I supposed to be so impatient? We spent eighty years of shukr. Now let's spend years in sabr. Okay. So Ayub alayhi salatu salam, he himself has accepted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's um, brought upon condition on him, okay? He's working with it because he understands. He understands that this situation is solely controlled by Allah. Allah is the one that was responsible for his prosperity and now Allah is responsible for his adversity, okay? So when Allah gave me the chance to live such a comfortable life for such a long period of time, why should I complain when he has now changed the situation and is demanding a different demeanor from me right, through the situation? Because prosperity demands gratitude, adversity demands patience. So he's got all these years under his belt of gratitude. Let's get a few years of patience under our belt. 18 years. Okay, that's a long period of time. But then what made him turn to dua? It's when some hurtful comments were hurled at him by the community members. Okay? Hurtful comments. So his dua is also showing patience. His dua is also showing patience. This is the phenomenal thing. What happens is you had certain people that are passing by and they said that the only reason Ayyub والسلام, is suffering this is because of some great sin he has done in his life. Now, Ayyub والسلام, is a prophet. Okay? 
prophets are protected from enormities and major sins. But a comment like that, remember, sometimes a comment might not hurt one an individual as it hurts another individual. So what they have done to this comment, they have attacked his relationship with Allah. They're basically saying that Ayyub was this, this great sinner due to which he is now facing this great test and trial, or we can even call it punishment. And that didn't sit well with Ayyub Okay, This statement did not sit well with him at all. So what did he do? Did he go and call those guys over and said, who are you to judge me? Because that's the first thing that we all do, right? Who are you to judge me? Who are you to make that statement? Okay, do you, are you God? Are you do you know the unseen? We can come up with a whole bunch of different statements. Are you Bani Sadhu something to do that? He heard these hurtful statements and he turned straight to Allah with this dua. Anni masani dur. Okay, oh my lord, adversity has touched me. So Allah, look at this. He is showing humbleness and respect. One of the things that when it comes to adversity to show respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you do not directly attribute the adversity to Allah this is part of the adab okay part of adab is that you do not attribute the adversity to Allah even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the source of all khair and and, and shar Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the source of all nafa and dur okay is a source of all good and you can say all benefit and all adversity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the sole, sole source of that. He's the one that dictates that. But the adab in expressing is that we do not directly attribute the adversity to him. So you saw that with Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. He said, وَإِذَا مَرِدْتُ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينَ When I become sick, Allah is the one that grants me a cure. Allah relieves me. Okay, he didn't say that. وَإِذَا when Allah makes me sick, he didn't say that. He says, when I become sick. So what has he done? He's now not attributed this to Allah out of adab. Same thing here. He didn't say that, oh Allah, you have brought adversity upon me. He said, I have been touched by adversity. I have been touched by adversity. So there's two things going on. His adab with Allah is phenomenal. Okay. He's not going ahead and saying, Oh Allah, why did you do this to me? Oh Allah, you're the one that did this to me. He didn't say that. It's like he's not showing any complaint to Allah. Allahu Akbar. He's not complaining to Allah. Allah, you did this to me. He's just now putting forward his situation in a respectful fashion. That I have been, what's it called? It, a touch by adversity. And what's the motivation behind it? It was the hurtful comments of those guys that are passing by. So he's hurt. Emotionally, physically, every conceivable conceivable way he's hurt. And this is how he's expressing himself. With adab and with humility. Masaniya dur. And now look at the indirect dua he says. Wa anta arhamur rahimin. You are the most merciful of those who express mercy. Say so indirectly saying, oh Allah have mercy upon me. He didn't say directly. He said it indirectly. Okay, and this is a beloved way of approaching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala admires. The Mufassidun say that the power that this subtle dua had was more powerful than an explicit dua. Okay, it was more ex it was more powerful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he comes to answer, look at this. Allahu Akbar. Subhanallah. Right now, you and I are anticipating some vaccine to be released and we get injected and somewhat become immune to this COVID virus. And due to which we can resume our normal lives, we can be as mobile as we were before, and we can enjoy life the way we used to. That's what we're all waiting for, right? Because we see the means. Ayyub when he made this dua, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed us to or basically in the religion, we are instructed to use the means, but not place our faith in the means and rely on the means. Okay? Ayyub some had no means. Nothing. Because remember, he's abandoned by the community, right? There's nothing there. He's only got his wife with him. 
So no one is there to come to him. He doesn't have money to buy medicine. He doesn't have a family that's going to really help him and support him with the exception of his wife who's serving him. He doesn't have the community to access and help him. So basically what I want to emphasize here is that in terms of resources that you can tap into to get assistance from Ayyub is nothing. Absolutely nothing. All he has is his turning to Allah in this humble way, in this beloved way, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes ahead and does his part. He tells Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam, Urkud birijlik. Now this is not in this part here. You'll find these passages which I'm making reference to in Surah Sa'd. He tells Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam, Urkud birijlik. Stomp your foot. Hada mughtasadun baridun wa sharab. Hada mughtasadun baridun wa sharab. So what happens? Very similar to the way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made arrangements for Hajar radiallahu anha arrangements to survive because obviously her food and drink supplies had depleted she has a an infant in her care she's got to do something to serve this child so Allah at that time sends Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam, who will come down stomp his foot and out comes the spring of Zamzam which later turns into the well of Zamzam as you and I know it today well, here Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam is told directly, no angel is sent by Allah. Allah tells Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam directly, Urkud birijlik, stomp your foot. As a result, a spring comes out. And Allah says, Hada mughtasan, this is a place to bathe. <clears throat> Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam is going to bathe. As a result of bathing in this water, which people typically term it as the water of life, you know these... Um, uh, what to call it? Uh, legends that you have. Okay, uh, there's another word that uh, I can't really call. But anyways, uh, we're not gonna say it's necessarily a myth. But you know these legends that you have about the the water of life, and then there's stories made up about this, and then there's also uh, attempts to try and locate this particular spring that Ayub Ali Salatu Sama had taken advantage of. And if you go on YouTube, you'll find like two, three different places that are being identified and this footage being shown. You can do that on your own time. But Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam, where is he going to be at this time? He's at the dump yard, away from the community. No cash, no resources. Allah tells him, stomp your foot. Water comes gushing out. Okay, Water comes gushing out. Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam is going to now be told to bathe in this because it's mughtasal, badid, it's cool. Washarab, it's also a drink. So here's your own water source, which in water is a source of life. Ayyub alayhi salatu wasalam will go and bathe in it. Look at this, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings yusr after usr. We all go through yusr, we all go through usr. We go through ease, we go through hardship. And fa'inna ma'al usri yusra. Look at this now. So Ayyub is going to bathe. His skin condition is there and then going to improve just as a result of bathing in this God-given water. Allah made it a source of shifa and not a conventional shifa because this is unheard of. That you bathe in water and your skin condition all of a sudden improves. It improved because Allah put the properties of Shifa inside there. Allah is the governor of the situation. So the properties of Shifa have been given to him. All of his skin condition is now improving. His body is being restored. That Sharab, he's told to drink that water. All the internal sickness is now being cleansed. The maggots. Look at the hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari. I wish I pulled it up before. But... There's a hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari that as all of this is now dropping, these maggots and so forth are dropping, it's being turned into gold. He's getting cash right there. Okay, it's being turned into gold. This is from the hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, so it's not a fairy tale. Okay, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in an instant, because of that humble dua, changed the condition 180 going from sickness to health, going from poverty to prosperity. And not only that, the family that he loved so much, 
Allah revived them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the same time gave him additional family. Because back in those days, being a family-centric community, family was something that you took a tremendous amount of pride over, especially when they were in great numbers. So Allah revived those who had passed because he is Muhyil Mauta. He is the one that gives life to the dead. And then he gave additional life through which now he can enjoy greater prosperity, bigger family, restored health, and living in better conditions that he did prior to this stage, this 18 year period of adversity. Allahu Akbar. Don't underestimate Allah. Okay? Don't underestimate Allah. Don't underestimate your power of dua. And this is what I'd like to close with. It's already 46. Look at time just flies, man. Uh, I didn't even get to finish all of this. But let me just finish off the, at least the verses, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fasta jabana lahu. We responded to him. Allah will respond to him. Allah responded to Ayyub alayhi salatu salam. He will respond to you. Just adopt the traits and the approach of these Anbiya alayhi salatu salam. There's a reason why Allah is sharing this with us. He's telling you, this is the right way of approaching me. That's basically what's being told to us for. So approach it the right way, not approach it my way. Okay? This is the right way. The right way is Allah's dictated way. So Allah says, Fastajabana lahu. We responded to him. Uh, it's like it's still mind-boggling me over the, the, the shortness of this dua, but how powerful it was. So Allah says, Fakashafna ma bihi min dur. We removed. Kashafa means to open up. So here in this case is removed. So we removed from him the adversity. Min dur. ahlahu. And we gave him his family. وَمِثْلَهُمْ And it's their equivalent with them. So the family is back to life. The ones that he's lost. And a new family is also being given to him. Which obviously over a period of time is going to happen. Right? He's going to have more children, more family to enjoy. Okay? And رَحْمَةً مِنْ عِنْدِنَا وَذِكْرَى لِنْعَابِدِينَ This is what we'll close off with. Rahmatam min indina. All of this was done as a mercy on our behalf. Remember, what did he say to Allah? Arhamur Rahimin. Wa anta arhamur rahimin. You are the most merciful of those who exercise mercy. So Allah is saying, as mercy, we did this for him. So this is what you're going to make dua for. We will all make this dua. Anni masaniya dur. Whether we're going through a financial uh, situation right now, a domestic situation, whether it's going to be a health situation, whatever it is, anni masaniya dur. Remember, me memorize this. That's why I went uh, and declared the verse 83. Okay, anni masaniya dur. Wa anta arhamur rahimin. Wa anta arhamur rahimin. You are the most merciful of those who express mercy. Just this doesn't even take that long to to do. But the moment we've done this, Allah is saying, Rahmatan min aidina. As mercy, we did this for him. If he did it for him, for Ayyub alayhi salatu salam, he can definitely do it for you because the Allah that was there for Ayyub alayhi salatu salam is the same Allah that is there for you. Wa dhikra lil abideen. And as a reminder for those who engage in worship, because the people who will always, who will really take, will really take these words seriously are those who turn and devote their time to Allah in worship. And even worship, it takes a great amount of struggle, sacrifice, and, and patience, depending on how far you want to excel, depending on how far you want to go, okay, in, your, in the accomplishment of your ukhrawi goals. So this is a reminder for us as well. I will close off with this, inshallah, and then next week, uh, if it's most likely it's going to be Eid next week, right? Whether it's going to be the Saturday or the Sunday, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. I can't really forecast it, which day it's going to be. You follow your local masjid, whatever they declare, inshallah, whether it's Saturday or it's Sunday, and work accordingly. But uh, I'd say I think ne next week we'll just give it off and we will resume the week after. And these sessions will continue, inshallah, until uh, we can start going back to our masjids and resume our live sessions there, inshallah. I will now leave at this. We do have 10 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, uh, and I will just, uh, at least, uh, yeah. Let, let's do that before I close off with the dua, inshallah. Bismillah. 
Let's open it up the Q&A box. Side here. That was great. My mouse is not working. Okay, let's do this. Okay. So, Sheikh Omar, I had a question regarding this verse. I came across above from this understanding that only upon resurrection will disbelievers realize the hereafter is real. So does that mean disbelievers won't face punishment in the grave or do they go through the same process as a believer? No, that's not the right implication. Uh, remember, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about two different periods uh, after thing, uh, uh, let's say two different blowings of the horn, right? Or the or the um, whatever instrument it's going to be. Wa nufi khafis sur, fa saiq man fi samawati wa man fi ardi illa man sha Allah. Thumma nufi khafihi ukhra, fa ida hum qiyamun yanzurun. Okay, fa ida hum qiyamun yanzurun. I believe that's in the twenty fourth juz. So the sword, the, the horn, it's going to be blown into. Every entity in the skies and the earth is now going to just, just fall. Okay, men, they're all going to lose their lives. Okay. Um, it says your internet connection is unstable. Okay. So, then it will be blown into one again, once again. Okay. Then it will be blown into once again. So at that time, now they're going to be standing, looking. So there's two periods here. So period number one, when it comes to the disbelievers, okay, or any person, believers, disbelievers alike, when you die, you're going into the grave, and upon going into your grave, you're going to have whatever experiences Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has uh, elaborated on, right? whether it's going to be a window of paradise or a window of hell for the disbeliever, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has elaborated on this and he's also spoken about the punishment of the grave. This will continue till the first blowing of the horn. Okay? The moment that that has been blown, all life and existence is going to cease, finished. Because everything, where are we buried? We're buried on this earth. This earth is going to finish. Okay? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yomanat with Sama Akataya Sijil or um the 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 verse about um uh the anyways the the Yoma to Baddalul Ardu Ghairal Ard. Yoma to Baddalul Ardu Ghairal Ard. Then that day, day of the judgment day of judgment is when the earth is going to be replaced with another earth. Ghairal Ard. Okay. So the moment this earth and everything, all of this existence ceases, the experience of the grave also ceases. Okay, this, it's finished. Then after that, going to be the revival period. Okay? You're going to have the second trumpet, which is now going to be the revival of life, the reconstruction of everything. At that time, in that reconstruction phase, that moment that you're going to have where everyone is now replaced in their graves or reconstructed back in their graves as it was before, okay? That brief period is going to be the period of rest for the disbeliever until they are pulled out and extracted from the, uh, from the, uh, the graves. And then they say, Ya wailina, man ba'athana min marqadina, hadha ma wa'ad ar-Rahman. At that time, it's the realization is going to hit them because they're seeing it now. One is the rejection based on information. Now they're seeing it, and now there's the expression, oh my God, this is it. This is exactly what was being spoken about. Okay? So this is what, when you piece everything together in the Quran, this is what the whole context is. It's not a matter of them going through a period of silence, and then they only come to realize that the oh, the akhirah is true after they are basically thing. Uh, taken out of their graves. So they're going to have that realization at that time. It's just, it just hit you so hard. Oh my God, this is it. 
Okay. Okay. Um, a lot of scholars say all 10 nights have possibility being night of Qadr. However, we have so many hadith from different scholars that state that there are signs. Can one sh worship all nights and search the nights to know which night it was? Is it discouragement for searching the night? Um, is that people will worship one night and not the rest? Well, um, yes and no. Remember, let's look at a few factors here. The Prophet ﷺ was made to forget. He was made to forget with the accurate time, right? Thumma unsituha. I was made to forget. Those are the words. Unsituha. So that knowledge was taken away from the Prophet ﷺ because of a little dispute that was going on in his presence. Now, um, he's said this much, it's in the final 10 nights. So what was the Prophet's practice? To go and do i'tikaf. To go and do i'tikaf in the last 10 nights. And in the i'tikaf, yajtahidu ma la yajtahidu fi ghayri. The Prophet ﷺ, for the complete duration of those 10 nights, he would now exert himself the way he would not exert himself in other nights outside of Ramadan. So it was all 10 nights. It wasn't just the nights, the odd nights. It was all 10 nights he was uh, exerting himself. Okay? And he, he went to the, to the degree that he would even keep his family awake, which he would not do throughout the year. Throughout the year when he's doing his tahajjud, he would not disturb the family. But these last 10 nights, no, make sure that they're all up. So in those 10 nights, one is definitely going to be Laylatul Qadr. Now, in order to give the satisfaction that we may have gotten it, yes, there are certain signs that the Prophet ﷺ has shared with us. But Ibn Mas'ud, the close student of the Prophet ﷺ, he says in one narration, which I was just reading the day before, I believe it's in Abu Dawood or Tirmidhi, it's one of those two sources, uh, where he says that he would go and tell people to worship all nights throughout the year. So for this very reason that's being asked about in the, in the question, that people will not become relaxed and eased. Uh, as a result, they would, not, uh, they would not lack in their efforts in the night. Every night they should exert themselves if it's practical, it's not going to be practical for everyone. But the aim should be to exert ourselves every night so that we are now developing this healthy relationship with Allah and uh, accumulating for us ourselves a lot of reward in the hereafter. So this is why, even though he, according to his opinion, Ibn Mas'ud, he was very explicit and blunt by saying it's the 27th. And when he's asked, why, why do you say it's the 27th? He says, because of signs that the Prophet Sallallahu had told us. So sorry, this hadith is in Sahih Muslim. And that's where he told one of the signs is that the following morning, the sun comes out without rays. Okay, so that's, that was his uh, thing, calculation. And at the same time, his rationale of not being public about this. Let's keep it vague so that people continue to worship continuously, inshallah, and take advantage of Allah's mercy on a perpetual basis, not on a part-time basis. So what I would say is, Forget what people are saying. Is it this night or not that night? Follow the sunnah of i'tikaf. Or if not, if you're not in i'tikaf, at least exerting ourselves for the complete 10 nights rather than just the odd nights, inshallah. Okay. What is the method of Eid Salah for those of us at home with so many opinions? Just resort to your Fiqh, whatever fiqh that you that you uh, follow. If you follow the Hanafi madhab, do it according to that madhab. If you follow the Shafi'i madhab, do it according to that madhab. Okay, all of them have their principles. All of them have uh, sound, um, what's we call, sound conclusions based on those principles. So they're not going to say this is right and this is wrong. You can only say that if everyone is acting on one set of principles, which they're not. Okay, they're all sound principles. They're different. They vary due to which you have different conclusions which are coming out. And by our job is فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ ذِكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of the scripture if you do not know. So if you just resorted to sound, or I should say, um, conclusions that are generational, they've been passed down throughout the generations, they're based on sound principles, then 
inshallah, um, there's nothing for us to worry about. But just to simplify the matter, whatever Islamic school of law you follow, follow the conclusions that have been cited there, inshallah. Okay. Jazakallah khair. I hope, inshallah, the rest of these, uh, the remainder of these days are blessed days for all of you. Please make dua for us and our family, inshallah. We make dua for all of humanity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes this condition away from us sooner than later. And inshallah, we will see you back in two weeks. Next week, we will give off because of the Eid weekend. I hope, inshallah, whatever way our Eid is going to look like, try and make it as enjoyable as you can, inshallah, because it's a day of enjoyment. Until then, inshallah. Zakala Khim, Subhanallah wa bihamdi, Subhanakallahuma wa bihamdik, Nashadwana ilaha illa ant, nastaghfiruka wa natubi lake, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.